If you've got multiple kids or maybe multiple folks that you want to receive an inheritance from you, is it okay to just list one of them as a beneficiary on your accounts and just give them instructions on how to divvy up the resources? Well, there's a few very big problems with that approach. I've got that more coming up. My name is Mike Bernard. I'm the host of The Wise Money Show. I'm also one of the certified financial planners right here at Corhorn Financial Group. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and smash that thumbs up button. This isn't a common practice, but we do see it from time to time. I've seen it some in the comments as well. And that is a situation where you're, you want to, um, to, to pass your, your assets, your financial assets, so maybe a bank account or your investment accounts, onto multiple beneficiaries, multiple multiple kids or family members, but listing each of them for one reason or another is just complicated or potentially problematic. Therefore, it's easier or you want to, or you're wondering if it's okay to just list one person as the beneficiary and then just tell them you spread it out to these individuals. These are this isn't common, but we do get this question from time to time. And here's a few situations. Well, you know, for, for us personally, um, the, the age difference between our oldest and our youngest is eight years. That can be a pretty big age difference. And if you've got a big gap between your kids, you might feel like, well, I'm just going to list the oldest child and then they'll know to divvy it up or I'll even just communicate it. You know, half of this goes to your, your younger sibling, something like that. If it's a blended family, might do the same because you'd be, if you had to list all of the kids, it would be a lot and you might say, you know what, we're gonna list this person and they'll know to divvy it up. The most common scenario is you've got a couple of kids and one is, is really responsible financially and the others are not, or the other is not. And therefore, they've always sort of been the, the responsible one and have taken care of things for the other and therefore, we're, it feels like the right approach to list them as the beneficiary and they will then uh, you know, manage the finances for the, other, for, the, for the other individual. Well, is that okay to do or are there problems with it? Well, there's, there's a handful of pretty big problems with it and not saying that, nope, financially responsible or not or big age difference or not, you've got to list everyone as a beneficiary. Now, I'll give you a solution here in, in a minute, but there are some really big problems that that arise if you do this. And, and I'd encourage you to think through these and sort through them with your CFP before taking, this, taking that action of just listing one person as a beneficiary. First is legally, that money is just that one person's. So if you have, again, let's go, let's go back to, you got two kids, one's really financially responsible, the other one has proven time and again to not be financially responsible. Well even listing just the one this just the one child as as the beneficiary legally it's all theirs and yes they're responsible so of course they'll share it and give give to their sibling what is what rightfully is due to them but legally they do not need to do that and and that sort of brings into light problem number 2 and that is Legally, because it's just that one individual's money now, it legally is, is accessible should that one individual have an issue. And well, what could happen? They're financially responsible. A divorce? What if they die, pass away early? What if they are, you know, have a lawsuit against them? Something like that. And again, you might say, oh, really unlikely. Well, you never know. A divorce? Gosh, you, you, never, you never know. Passing away early? Yeah, totally totally out of their control or, or, or could happen. And so legally, if the money is theirs, and even if they say, or they know, or if they act, no, I'm going to give my sibling what is theirs, and I'm gonna give it to them X amount a year, every single year until they have their half. If they pass away or an event occurs before that is carried out, legally, there's, there's no recourse, there's, there's, no, there's no going back. So that's the second big issue. The third big issue, guys, is the taxes. So I've, I've heard this where um, you, know, you might list it for a bank account or something like that, and, and that's one thing. But, but on an IRA or Roth IRA or, or, or other accounts, even a non-IRA account, but one that's invested, when you just list one individual as a beneficiary, 
and they're responsible for, for giving to the, to, to the others, it's all gonna land on their tax return. And, and, and if it's an IRA, then any withdrawals will land on their tax return, could push them into a higher tax bracket, could have lots of consequences. If it's not an IRA, but just a regular investment account, and, and it gets a step up in basis, sorry for the jargon there, any interest or future capital gains will land on that person's tax return. And, and I've seen it where, well, let's calculate the tax and let's offset that from, and guys, that just gets super complicated. And it gets super complicated while everyone's uh, aware of what's going on. But again, someone slips on a banana peel or, or there's some other issue and, and now it's less clear and those details aren't managed and, and the taxes can really become a burden on the one individual that is, that is listed. Not only a burden, but there could even be more tax because it's all landing on that one person's tax return instead of split between two people in this example or multiple people. And then the fourth issue or fourth concern is when that individual, when, when they legally receive the inheritance and then they start giving either all at once or in chunks, the, the other person's share of it, and I, I'm putting share in air quotes because legally they, they, don't, they don't have to, but it, morally if they, if, they, if, they, if they do or whatever, that's a gift. That's, that's a gift, and, and if you give more than a certain amount every single year, then you have to report it to the IRS. It might not be taxable, but it starts counting towards an annual lifetime gift exclusion, and there's cost associated with that and filing a tax return, and I, you know, depending on how much we're talking here, if, if it's a significant amount, then, uh, then, then there could eventually be, be gift tax implications, that sort of thing. So I understand, you know, there's a few different scenarios where you might feel the urge to say, well, I do want to have multiple people receive this, receive my assets as, uh, as an inheritance, but I'm only gonna leave it to one individual and, and they'll be able to sort out, sort out the rest. Well, uh, while I understand that urge, in practice, it is just very problematic. So what's a different way of doing it? Setting up a revocable living trust. Well, I would say two things. One is just listing out all the beneficiaries and, and just saying, hey, you know, if you're, if you're avoiding listing all of that out because, oh, that's just too much, one person can handle it, no, list it out. But if there's a reason beyond, well, I just didn't wanna write it all down. You know, there's, there's seven kids between this blended family and I didn't wanna write it all out. Uh, that's, that's too much for them. For, the, for, for Fidelity or the bank to figure out, now list it out. But if it's more than that, if there's a reason that you know, someone's not financially responsible or someone's going through uh, a, you know, a marriage separation right now, and if I were to pass away when that's not clear, I, I wouldn't want this to go to, to what could be their ex-spouse or, or whatever else, create a re revocable living trust. A revocable living trust means that it, you are still in charge while you're alive. Revocable means you can revoke, you can make changes. It, the trust is not a separate entity from you while you're alive. And therefore you're not locked into anything. So, so if, if, hey, if someone, one of, the, one of the kids is going through a separation and that's why you don't wanna list them as a beneficiary that, hey, that could take a while to sort out and what if it doesn't fully sort out? You don't want you know, your, your assets going to someone outside of the family. Well, you could change that in the, tr you could list it a, a trust and then you could eventually change it if it does get sorted out during your lifetime. So working with your certified financial planner and then working with a competent estate planning attorney on exactly what the issues are uh, that are unique to you, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that a trust approach, revocable living trust with certain, with certain instructions listed in there can help you sort out legally what you want to happen in a manner that, that uh, diffuses and avoids those risks that I mentioned of just leaving all of the, the assets to one individual. So work with your certified financial planner on that. And this again, guys, is a very clear example of, uh, of how all six areas of your financial life need to be working together. Estate planning is one of them. And of course, present financial position and investment planning, that's where your assets are primarily held. You need to be aware of this from an estate planning standpoint. So work with your CFP on that. If you don't have a CFP on your team, you can contact one on my team. Find us online, corhorn.com. That's corhorn with K-WiseMoneyShow.com. You can find us there as well. Or send us an email, info at corhorn.com. All right, there you have it. Go out and take your next wise step in your financial life.